welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivet Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. Today, we discuss the recent Supreme Court ruling removing the authority of the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases from oh. power plants. We speak to two amazing guests. First, Gina McCarthy, the first national climate advisor, formerly the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency and president and CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council. And we speak to John Podesta, founder and chair of the Center for American Progress, former counselor to President Barack Obama, and former White House Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton. Thanks for being here. So this is the second of our two special episodes this week. And uh, the last one was fairly somber, given the chances of the next Conservative government in the UK not having climate and energy in the same level of precedence as the previous one. But this conversation is even more cause for outrage because as all listeners to this podcast will know, the Supreme Court has gone and done that thing that we have been afraid for years that it would do. And that is to curb the ability of the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States to regulate and limit greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. This came from a landmark ruling on June the 30th And it was a 6-3 majority led by Chief Justice John Roberts in the case of West Virginia versus the EPA. Now, this deals a major blow to the Biden administration in its attempts to regulate greenhouse gas emissions at a critical moment when, honestly, confidence that the US was going to meet its commitments was already at a low ebb. So I'd love to just start there and hear how did the two of you receive this news? Yeah, so honestly... um quite quite a blow uh quite a blow to the soul i would say mm. but i also really wonder and that's why i'm really really excited about our conversation with gina to understand yes from a political point of view this has been quite a blow um and we will go into the interpretation that has come from um from from the right side uh, of uh, politics in the United States. But there is something that is a little bit odd, which is that the ruling was based on the Clean Power Plan, which is an Obama strategy that never came into effect. And so it's a little bit odd to see something like this on something that uh, actually wasn't moving forward anyway. So it is sort of, is it, is, it a, is it a double negative? Not only is the clean power plant not moving forward, but in addition to that, we have this ruling. Or is the ruling actually a pretty narrow decision that is not really going to affect the course of greenhouse gas emissions in part because the regulation is not quite that uh, much of a break, but also because companies, as we know from Trump years, companies and cities and states will continue to uh, to move forward on decarboniz- decarbonization out of their own self-interest. So it's a little bit strange, and I'm very, very interested in how Gina is going to interpret this for us. And commentators seem split, right? I mean, I've heard people say this is the end of the world and others say this kind of doesn't matter, which is what you're pointing to. So, yeah, that's going to be really fascinating. Mr. Paul? Yeah, I think it's really sort of dark and crazy, frankly. I think the US Supreme Court has been filled with Trumpites from a kind of ideological corporate nightmare, darkness world. And... um. Look, I, I actually see it as, to some degree, linked to Roe versus Wade. Um, you know, you think back to I don't know, was it uh, August twenty twenty one when the US pulled out of Afghanistan? You know, actually, I think the US did more than just pull out of Afghanistan. I think they made a some kind of decision at, at the level of the highest court to turn into Afghanistan. Just this morning, <laughs> I was I was kind of reading through the Afghan Penal Code, Article four hundred two says, as you do. Yeah, as, uh, you know, abortion uh, leads to long imprisonment, not exceeding seven years. If a doctor performs an abortion, a medical doctor, they also get the maximum punishment for the crime. So, you know, there's something really strange going on. Um, There is some notion, I think, by the court of the sense of sort of purity. uh, And there is a theoretical uh, case that the 
the, the, the US EPA doesn't have a specific specified uh, duty in its constitution to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Well, guess what? When the EPA was formed, people were not worried about climate change, didn't really know of it as a significant force in society. What's happened is uh, a, another piece of dogmatic architecture of the US constitution saying that, you know, that the cities shouldn't rule the countryside means that uh, you know, voters in Wyoming get 80 times as much influence over the US uh, uh, Senate as voters in California. And quite frankly, uh, money and the influences of coal companies uh, have found a way to stop the Senate from passing uh, uh, laws to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So when the government tries to use the Environmental Protection Agency go look at the name. And then the Supreme Court says, oh, we're not, you know, you, by some dogmatic detail, you can't use the Environmental Protection Agency. You've got to, you've got to deduce that, that the, US, the US is not really a functioning democracy at the moment because it is not supporting the will of the people. And the fact that the Supreme Court will endanger the national security of the United States and the national security of the world to, to, to promote dogmatic interpretation of law, which must constantly evolve in our society, is an outrage. And, you know, I kind of think of the great threats to the world. And, and I'm afraid to say the US Senate and the US Supreme Court are, are looking like those threats when yeah. I always thought of them as our saviour. Well, particularly when this well, report... Well, tell us what you really think. Yes, right. <laughs> and particularly when this report comes out from Dartmouth that points out that the US climate pollution has caused $2 trillion worth of damage to other countries. That was an astonishing piece of research that came out just the other day as well. And Paul, I just go back to... I mean, you're right, of course, that the founding fathers or no, didn't enshrine the law to for, for founding government. Founding mothers would have done, by well, the way. Well, founding but. mothers maybe would have done. But that was the, what, where that came from, it's maybe worth explaining to listeners, is that what the Clean Air Act does do is it provides the executive branch of government with the ability to find that other gases are dangerous and to create what's called an endangerment finding. And therefore, those new gases that science now says with new science are dangerous can then subsequently also be regulated under existing legislation. And this was the plan that Barack Obama put in place. I remember I was there in 2013. I was invited as I was running CDP North America to go and meet President Obama and sit there on this very hot day as he gave this brilliant speech with Gina McCarthy sitting to one side, explaining this legal mechanism that he was going to utilize, which was this endangerment finding. They'd been very careful and science had found that carbon dioxide was dangerous to human health, so therefore they were going to regulate it under the Clean Air Act. It is not an unman unmandated piece of work. Um, I actually remember that I nearly didn't go to that day because my wife was due to have my son two weeks later, and we thought, oh, my God, it's too scary. It's too close to the due date. I can't go on the train from New York down to Washington. And I was sitting very generously ushered into the front row, and I stopped getting messages back from my wife about 20 minutes into the talk. And I thought, there's a couple of scenarios here, but one of them is that she's gone into labor and she's no longer looking at her phone. So I was like, I've got to get out of here. So I got down on my hands and knees about two thirds of the way through the speech and crawl along to the edge of the aisle, past so Bill sweet. Clinton, so Harry so Reid, a couple of other people, got to the <laughs> edge and started legging it down the road out front. And of course, my wife texted me 10 minutes later, she said, oh, hi, sorry, I was in the shower. So that was my experience of the endangerment finding day in 2013. I so wish I had a video of you <laughs> crawling through. You but, got but, a but, but Tom, you, you sound like a bit of a, <laughs> well, nice, sweet Tom. Um, you sound like a bit of an expert here. So is the Supreme Court saying that, and I've heard this before, I think, that greenhouse gases, because they don't immediately poison you or immediately cause your lung problems, they're not dangerous. And therefore, that they rule against the brilliant case that Obama, former uh, editor of the Harvard Law Review, and they, they, they find that Obama was wrong. Is that the idea? Well, this is why I'm fascinated to talk to Gina. It's what I don't understand, because there's a clear provision in the, in the Clean Air Act that you can have an endangerment process to find that a new gas is dangerous, and then that endangerment finding allows you to regulate it. So my understanding is that what's happened is that the Supreme Court has said you can no longer do that. You need to go back to the House and the Senate to get this new authority to now regulate these other gases. So yeah, but, what but, but, I don't understand... But it's important to understand why. why they did that, right? Why did Chief Justice John Roberts uh, pen this ruling and what 
legal ground is he standing on to do that? And what he has done is he has reached way back into his back pocket into something that is called the major questions doctrine in the United States, right. which posits that courts must look to Congress rather than agencies, specialized agencies like the EPA, when considering regulations that would carry, quote-unquote, economic and political significance. I see. So there is no questioning that there's economic and political significance, which is the weird thing about this. So, yes, there is economic and political significance of climate change, um, but because of the major questions doctrine, then it should not be EPA, it should be Congress. So that's sort of a, you know, a back pocket card that he put on the table in order to come forward with um, the ruling that he that he wrote and for which he got six votes on the Supreme Court. Um, now, w this also means that it's actually very, very linked to November elections. Of course. Because that is now going to stand, and it's going to very much depend now on the new Congress that that the United States will have in November. So it's an interesting question whether that was sheerly a legal in interpretation that he took that card out, or is there any space, any scenario for someone who could have thought, hmm, in November, we're going to have Congress back, uh, and therefore this is the way to do it. Sorry, but that has been a nagging little thought. Hmm. No, I mean, that's a question for both of them, but particularly for John, right, who's such a deep thinker on these issues. And also I'd point out, thank you for clarifying that on the major questions. I had heard that, and that's really helpful to have that clarification from you. But interestingly, what that legal ruling doesn't do is question the endangerment finding, right? No one's saying that greenhouse gases aren't dangerous. Exactly. It's just saying we need to find a different source of authority to regulate from them. From. Yes, yeah. but not only does it not question the endangerment, but ironically... It actually confirms yes. that climate change and that greenhouse gas concentrations, growing concentrations, is and does have economic and political significance, which, frankly, they have not been wanting to accept. So it's such an odd ruling. Yeah. Well, but is it odd? I mean... At, you know, the January 6th hearings and the extraordinary um, leadership of, you know, surprising politicians, and I, and I, and I cannot help uh, particularly highlighting the extraordinary bravery of Liz Cheney, for example, demonstrates the ex just the vast cynicism of Donald Trump. Now, I mention that because we remember on the campaign trail, you know, Trump digs coal. Uh, and we know that fossil fuel backers, particularly in the coal industry, have given enormous support to Donald Trump. He put Brett Kavanaugh in the Supreme Court. He led to this legal trickery. And, you know, there are people arguing that, oh, well, you know, democracy is being served by this because we'll we'll go back to the Congress. But we know the Congress is gridlock and, and controlled by sectional interests through the Senate. So, you know, it's 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 very clever to come up with these sort of legal strategies. And thank you once again for describing them, Christiana. But these people are very brave. And I call them brave because they're also very stupid. These brave, stupid people are exposing themselves to the ire of the entire F asterisk 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 in world uh, and, you know, woe betide them as extreme weather becomes ever more present because I think, you know, the next couple of decades are going to be about looking for who was responsible for this asinine crime against humanity. Right. On that bombshell, um, I think we should give Gina a call. And let's bear in mind the last time we talked to Gina... She was sitting in a car park driving from Boston to Washington, <laughs> right. full of enthusiasm and excitement for her role as na the first ever national climate advisor. Um, and of course, she's done many things, but the big climate deal has been elusive. And now we're faced with this enormous roadblock, or potentially not, she'll tell us, in the form of this Supreme Court ruling. So should we try and reach her? Well, hold on. Tom, if you were crawling through that... Um, for, uh, Mm. major public event. I hope that was broadcast by <laughs> There must be a TV. video of it somewhere. I'm yeah. trying to find some film of him G crawling. Gina, under McCarthy, you say, uh, Gina McCarthy, you say, was sitting there because she was the EPA administrator. Administrator, correct? yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. 
So, so you know, th- this is absolutely, well, let's see what she says, but is this really a dagger in her heart personally? Because she was the EPA administrator when Obama um, announced the... Oh, yeah, she, the, she led the science that led to the endangerment finding. That was absolutely, she is, no one is more intrinsically connected to this than Gina. So let's talk to her. Let's get her on the phone. Let's talk but to her. But before we do, because I think we have like two minutes or something, didn't you say, Tom, that, that you, you'd had some response from Chris Skidmore? Is that right? Yes, that's true. Thanks, Paul. Let's, uh, let's just turn to that for a second before we call Gina. So... Um, Regular listeners will know that we put out a podcast two days ago in which we had Chris Skidmore MP on and he talked about the... Oh, sorry, sorry, Chris Skidmore MP of the UK. We Thank, switched countries. It's a global Thank podcast. Thank you very much. Okay. Slap, slap, slap. Code switching, please, everybody. We're going back to the Conservative Party leadership race, which is unfolding on the other side of the puddle, as Christiana calls it, and everyone else calls it the pond, um, uh, uh, where we are looking at who the next leader of the Conservative Party and therefore Prime Minister of the UK will be. And he told us that he was going to ask all of the candidates in public whether or not they would endorse the UK's net zero 2050 goal. He duly did that 24 hours later. And interestingly, what we found is that Rishi Sunak, Liz Trust and Liz Truss and Penny Mordaunt, the three front runners, all did come out and say that they would support the net zero 2050 target. The others, Tom Tugendhat, said he would push the net zero target back. And Kemi Badenoch. And he got she, knocked out. No, no, he's still in it, Tom Tugendhat. Oh, oops. Um, but Suella Braverman has been knocked out. But Kemi Badenoch, who is another leadership hopeful, said she wanted a completely new approach to tackling climate change that was not based on targets, which is a bit bizarre. So anyway, Chris Kidmore, if you didn't listen to that episode, do go back and listen to it. It was very insightful. Chris was brilliant. He was as good as his word. He asked all the candidates, and now we have much more visibility. And the three front runners are all in favour. Three front so runners are all in favour, yeah. So that's, that's pretty good. Okay, now let us go to the USA and get hold of Gina McCarthy. Clay, can we give her a ring? Yep. Back across the puddle. Across the puddle. (laughs) There she is. Hello. How are you, Christiana? How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing, well, I'm personally doing fine and the world is completely crazy, Gina, as I'm sure you will, uh, you will agree. <laughs> I feel like uh, it, it's, it's just a bizarre world right now. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> what, what could go wrong seems to be. Is going wrong. So it's just, holy smokes. But, you know, there's lots of good things happening. So we just have to motivate ourselves to recognize what we can't do and to run as fast as we can where we can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Gina, so I, I'm sure you have an absolutely crazy day. Thank you very much for uh, for taking our call so uh, abruptly. Gina, on this episode of the podcast, we're trying to understand what on earth happened at the Supreme Court with respect sure. to EPA? And we yeah. honestly, we are sort of feel like we're dancing around this. So we wanted to get you as being the most authoritative person since you were the EPA administrator when yeah. uh, when the Obama uh, clean power plan came through. Gina, here is our big question. From what we have read, some people are saying that this is absolutely devastating and that this is going to severely curtail anything that the Biden administration would want to do on emissions and on on climate change. Other people are saying, well, yeah, it's a sweeping political pronouncement, but it's a rather narrow decision, and it only addresses the EPA authority under one provision of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Power Plan, which is the Obama strategy to cut emissions that never came into effect. So could you please explain, should we be panicked or not? <laughs> or both. Or both. Wow, that, that, that's, a, that's a range of emotions, isn't it? <laughs> you know, let, let's just be really clear. It, this was a very narrow decision. Okay. You know, we were all very worried about the potential on this decision to actually take away the agency's authority to regulate greenhouse gases or to take away any ability even to use Section 111, which is the the section that we use to develop the clean power plan. That did not happen. 
You know, EPA still has broad authority to regulate. EPA still can regulate under 111D, which was the exact um, way in which we chose to regulate. Um, it, but it sent a signal that is more broadly a signal that the Supreme Court is sending and uh, about basically it was sort of like a shot across the bow, not hitting the our issue directly, but just saying we're going to be on the watch for decisions like the Clean Power Plan, because we think that the agency took too much latitude in interpreting Congress's intent, and you should go back to Congress. Now, rest assured, I realize, as do many others, that that kind of analysis, should we have to apply it, is an effort to bring us backwards in time, mm. not forwards and build momentum. So we're going to have to be careful to make the case. But Christiana, the amazing thing about the Clean Power Plan is that that it was challenged in the D.C. Circuit. And before the D.C. Circuit could even speak to it, it was uh, stayed by the Supreme Court, which is unprecedented from being implemented. But the D.C. Circuit continued and said it was a legitimate action to take. It did not exceed, exceed the agency's authority. And then the Supreme Court made this decision. But in the meantime, you know, the, the clean power plan, its goal was to get 32 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And it actually achieved those reductions, even not being in place by simply sending a strong signal that looked at the way the world is moving. And so the best thing I can say to you is that we were disappointed with it, but it doesn't change the reality mm -hmm of where the world is heading. We are not going backwards to invest in coal in the United States of America. We are moving and running to clean energy because frankly, the private sector knows that that's where we're heading and where they need to head. So people can be disappointed and upset and worry about the next shoe dropping. But frankly, the, the, the history of where we've been and where we're heading tells us that with President Biden's clarity of where we want to go by his being absolutely unmoved by the Supreme Court decision, he's actually doubling down and saying, you know, we can do more, we can move forward, because because we know we have legal authority under a variety of regulations, both EPAs, the Department of the Interior, the Department of uh, the, the, the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, we have all kinds of authority, and we're going to use every lever, every creativity, and we're going to keep moving in the boldest way that we possibly can. Gina, are we in, um, with respect to maturity on climate action, yeah. are we tiptoeing our way to the point where, I, I hate I hate to say this, please excuse yeah. me and please love me despite what I'm going to say, um, are we tiptoeing our way to the point where regulation is becoming less important and where the market is picking up the forces of advancement. Because honestly, if we are at that point, that would actually be a very, very interesting lever of transformation because regulations are always going to become going left, right, left, right, left, right, right? Because we, yeah. most of us live in democracies. But yes. if the force of the market is actually has more, uh, more strength, then we actually might be getting somewhere. Is that where we are? Well, Christiana, you know, I've been this nerdy regulator for, for decades. And that's why and, I asked you to please love me despite <laughs> my question. Yes. No, I think I think it's a really great question. And it's something that I hope people will really start embracing. N number one is that regulations have always driven reductions to be able to protect 
clean air and clean water, traditional, absolutely essential needs of the public. That's what they're designed for. And how we did do that is to look at the newest opportunities, the newest technologies you have available. We have to look at cost in almost every decision that gets made on regulation. So we have to argue to a great extent that the market can and should move in, in a particular direction without exceeding cost parameters that would make it burdensome for the very communities we're trying to serve, right? That's how regulations yes. work. And EPA has reams of regulations that can continue to push and will continue to push as hard as we can to actually restore the kind of, uh, of faith people have in government that we can can run contrary to fossil fuels, which is a is the the folks, the special interest folks who have been trying to take us backwards and preserve their spot. We can move forward and make new demands on the market because we know that for the first time in history, we have technologies that can work and work cheaper than fossil fuels. So the breadth of opportunities on the on just a pure regulatory side are gigantic. You mm -hmm. match that with things like the bipartisan infrastructure law, which are investments that keep sparking new. You take a look at what we're doing in the transportation sector, just with EVs alone. The auto industry itself says we're going there most 100% by 2035, right? Right, when right. You look Look right. at solar. It is winning hands down. Billions of private dollars are being invested. Every single week, we are talking about work that we can do in the market today that we've never had the opportunity before. And we can do it and push it with investments as well as regulation in ways that is going to save people money, grow lots of jobs, and instead of going backwards to hang out with the fossil fuel industry, we're going to outrun them because the market has changed. The market is now billions of dollars in investment in this stuff. So we are no longer going to be front running everything. We're going to be underpinning so it can never go backwards while we front run those things that continue to be essential to our public health safety and our kids' future. But Gina, if, if I may say, um, you express perfectly, to me anyway, the spirit of the leadership of the United States on climate change, which is a global issue of enormous importance. I have two questions for you. I mean, you partially answered one of them. Yes. Who benefits from this Supreme Court ruling? Who wanted it and made it happen? And is, is are they without consequences? Is it possible to interfere with something of this global scale without consequence? You know, the the it, it's clear that this decision, um, it, its intent and its outcome um, was to look at the law in ways that that are so narrow that they they take away opportunities of government to fundamentally protect people in ways that I believe each and every one of these laws intended to do. Right. You know, they intended to tell EPA, mm -hmm. you have to protect people from fundamental pollution. EPA, mass versus EPA, which was when greenhouse gases were officially regulated or are required to be regulated under the Clean Air Act. We passed that threshold long ago. So it is no question that this is an intent to bring us backwards. It is no question about who the winners are here. It's the fossil fuel companies or the folks who make money or get donations from the fossil fuel mm. companies who are holding this back. But I think that the Supreme Court is going to have a, a huge challenge on its hands if that majority thinks that what they did 
that a few weeks ago is going to stop the avalanche of movement to clean energy that will not necessarily rely on regulation, but needs regulation to accelerate it at the pace and scope we need. Our job now isn't to bemoan that we don't have all the tools we need. It's to drive those tools into the agenda of every single private sector entity and working with states and and cities to drive this moving forward. So I still remain very bullish on our ability to make these things happen. It's going to be very challenging in the short run. You know, it still remains difficult to get to the aggressive levels that that we needed in 2030. We need Congress to act on investments that are actually going to make that change and make those reductions and more possible. But even if we don't get it, Paul, you're looking at, I think what I'm looking at, I was just reading yesterday about battery technology and where they think that's heading and how quickly. And I'm sitting there going, man, these are game changers. You know, these are the things that that I think we need to rely on when we balance all the emotions of the give and takes of of life. Mm -hmm. You know, I I just you know, I'm seeing solar like I have never seen before. We wanted 30 gigawatts by 2030. I'm telling you that the, the world has changed. We need to set our sights on going further than that. And, and it's because it it's the way people want to do business now. They're going to make money. They know they're going to make money. And as soon as that threshold is passed, it, do, it does become a struggle to make it go fast and fast and fast because that's what we need. But there's no question that the world is changing. It's going in the direction that we would all want to address and tackle our climate crisis. Gina, I love the way you describe that and the speed of the unfolding technology and capital deployment. And really, that's the big change since you were EPA administrator, right? And since Christiana and I were at the UN, this is a different world that we're in. But as you said, just then, we still need regulation to accelerate it. And you've said since this Supreme Court ruling that the Biden administration is now going to have to get creative to find ways to make this happen. Can you give us some examples of the types of creative solutions that are going to need to be deployed by the administration? Yeah, uh, let me let me give you a couple of them. You know, one is obviously the bipartisan infrastructure law gave us a lot of resources. You know, one clear example is the 7.5 billion that's now drawn additional billions of investment in uh, the infrastructure we need for electric vehicles. You know, all of the the charging stations, you know, as recently as I think yesterday or the day before GM announced that they're working with other manufacturers to actually add many more, you know, uh, stations, getting them out there so that you can get really build the kind of infrastructure you need. That's important. That has to happen. But one of the most creative uh, efforts that President Biden took was when he saw that the the import of solar solar panels was falling short in terms of the demand we have in the United States for solar and what that means for our ability to achieve greenhouse gas reductions. He used the Defense Production Act there and he used the Defense Production Act on critical minerals, which are going to be necessary for battery manufacturing, which means he's using every authority available to him so that we can rearrange budgets to basically start demanding the kind of investments where we need it most. And he's he and he basically said, okay, federal government, if we have a problem with solar, we're going to get go after manufacturing tax credits that are going to actually continue to drive more domestic manufacturing. And we just saw last week an announcement of a manufacturing facility being opened up that are going to start filling the supply chain gap for, for domestic solar here. And he told the federal government that if we're asking for solar, I want every single building in the federal government to go electric, Mm. to go clean energy. So so we have tools and the president is not stopping at regulation. He's starting there and demanding it. But he's he's really using every creativity he has out of in his availability to address climate like the crisis that it is. Gina, are you um, are you concerned as the court, you know, closes one 
regulation uh, possibility. Are you concerned that there will be even more orchestrated attempts or, in fact, even successes at closing success, successive, successfully closing successive um, regulation uh, capacity to, as you say, accelerate? Because, yes, we all agree that there is momentum, but we also agree that that momentum can and needs to be accelerated by regulation. Are you, are you worried that, you know, there is a concerted effort here to close all those regulation possibilities? I think, I mean, every single regulation that EPA does, speaking from experience, uh, is challenged in court. I mean, we have a pretty big legal force there. But, but, but w let me tell you about the range of sort of regulations that are available and going to be used. And this is just over the first term of the Biden administration, right? We're talking about moving forward with regulations already on methane. We're going after that big time. We're going after HFCs. We got another regulation coming out on that. Both of those are high super polluting pollutants that we can start going after big time directly. But indirectly, we're going after another mercury and air toxic standard because we know that when you drive mercury down, you actually uh, reduce greenhouse gases because you're making it less competitive for heavy mercury uh, fossil fuel technologies to be acceptable in the marketplace. We're looking at a, a new cross-state air pollution rule that is traditional regulations. We're looking at a, a particulate matter, national ambient air quality standard. We're looking at you know, everything from coal combustion residuals to go back again so that we can attack coal ash once and for all. We're looking at effluent limitation guidelines, which is specific specifically going to challenge more technology innovation in the system. These are all traditional regulations that have well-documented uh, guide reels on what to do. They are not 111, which has only been used a few times. These are ones that have been used endlessly. Good luck if you think you can get past the 30-year <laughs> history of case studies on this and, and, and examples of litigation that actually showed us how strong these are. And so we're going to keep moving forward. And frankly, we're not done at all with 111. Not at all. It didn't close us off from going <laughs> back and using that on industrial sources, manufacturers, and others, we have abilities to keep pushing forward, and we're going to use them all. And that can include, you know, systems that that have, you know, carbon capture, systems that look at shifts to green hydrogen. These are all well within the the the, the bailiwick of what EPA has been doing for decades. It will not fall prey to this major questions doctrine uh, that that was the authority of uh, yes. to make that last decision. Gina, These if are I can, standard yeah. operating practices. If I can borrow a phrase, they are doing their worst yeah. and you are doing your best. And thank you so much on behalf of the great majority of citizens across the world. Thanks, Paul. And, and the fun thing is that you know, it, it's no longer just EPA or the Department of the Interior in this game now. You know, every single agency can contribute. Look to what housing and urban development can do there on, on yeah. how to get more efficient and, uh, and effectively electrify homes every step of the way. We're looking at how we use agriculture to change our agriculture practices, not just to reduce water use, but to get rid of the fertilizers, to actually start using the best techniques possible. We have every single agency gets together all the time under the banner of our climate policy office to think about climate as a core component of everything they do, like the work that the SEC is doing to actually stop the greenwashing of the oh, finance yeah. community and to yeah. start telling the truth about your greenhouse gas emissions so that you and me, if we had a couple of extra bucks and invest it, which none of probably neither of us do because we all do, <laughs> you know, work in the same kind of. Uh, we, we do God's work. Exactly. And God doesn't and he doesn't pay, pay. That well immediately. It's a sort of down payment on. She doesn't pay. Time. She pays in a different way. <laughs> 
But we, we could really know then who we're going to invest in, who we're going to buy from. These are going to be yeah. the questions that we can bring to the table and actually make a big difference on. Gina, you know, the last time we had the honor of having you on the podcast, um, you were driving from Boston down to Washington to take up your office. And uh, you warned us that you weren't going to lose any of your personality or any of your spunkiness <laughs> when you joined the White House. And I am so delighted to see you have not. So, um, so how, if you remember quickly, you know, back to, to that drive, how, how do you feel today with respect to how you were feeling when you were driving down to DC? That's a, you know, Christiana, that's a, a really good question. You know, President Biden has pulled together a really terrific team of people. And honestly, I, I in all honesty, I can say this now, I had my doubts about this whole of government approach, mainly because when I was at EPA, I seemed to be the only ones at times running in that direction of, of looking at climate and everything I did, I, but, but it's working. <laughs> You know, I, so I feel really good about that. And I think what I try to tell young people a lot is that these blips in the road, like the Supreme Court decision, which I legitimately think of as a blip in this long term effort, you know, I, I just feel like. What we really need to do most is to stay hopeful and to recognize that the world is changing. It's going in the direction we want it. We're not any more rowing up upstream. Yep. What we're trying to do is make sure that we row as fast as we can mm. to make right. change continue. And change happens in leaps and bounds. It's never a tiny shift. And what I'm seeing right now are leaps and bounds that I just never thought would exist right now. And so I'm I'm excited about the future and I'm more grateful than ever that I've been part of this administration and a president who's not going to be weak on this stuff and not going to cower when he gets a decision he doesn't like. He calls it out and he says, we're going to find another way. And he drives it. I love that. It's it's I don't think it's as obnoxious as I am, but close to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is wonderful to be obnoxious about those things these days, but God bless. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you really, really for uh, for coming at the, at the spur of the moment. And above all, thank you for your spunkiness and not sacrificing it at all. Back at you. The only person spunkier than me could possibly be you, Christian. <laughs> That's quite a competition. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Gina. Thanks, Gina. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Gina. Bye. -bye. Bye. Holy cow, she is astonishing as ever and so full of energy in that role. It's amazing to see how she brings that energy and dynamism to it. What do you think, both of you? It kind of breaks my heart how someone with that good a heart and find a, and that fine a mind is is playing some stupid chess game with her own government. You know, she's clearly has the interests of the people, the scientific community, the public consensus, the desperate need. She's she's marching with history to try and protect our civilization. And she's in a stupid chess game with some very reckless people who have no sense of of the of the the stakes that they're playing with. But anyway, I just I, I just love it. It's, it's kind of, when, you, when you speak to her, you just brighten up. I felt like a sunflower that had come out, you know, and smiling. Yeah, I mean, she is just so fantastic, right? And, and as I said there at the end, so good to see that she hasn't lost any of, uh, of her nerve on this and her, her valor and her, her courage just to continue to plow forward no matter what. Um, but but her explanation of the impact of the uh, court ruling or the lack of impact or the measured small impact was very reassuring to it me. Was. And I, I come yeah. back to one of my favorite images, which is we really have to make sure that we are not confusing the tide for the current. Yes. Mm. Because, you know, the tides go up and down, in and out, and I, I know because I sit here right in front of them, and every time that the tide goes either up or down, we, we tend to panic. And the fact is that what is really important is the underwater current. 
Yeah. And so we should not confuse those two things. And I thought she did a brilliant job of explaining how they are very, very different and how the current continues to move in the right direction. I love that metaphor, Christiana, because that's exactly what I felt listening to her, is that what she did such a good job of is immediately zooming up to the most important level, which is this transformation is happening. It is unfolding at an accelerating pace. There are thousands and millions of data points that can that can um, evidence that. And there are myriad ways in which the government is utilizing its authority to accelerate that process and regulate in order to move it forward. Now, if one ruling has come down and that has obviously, for understandable reasons, got onto the front page of the paper, that is unfortunate, and we can't hide from the reality of that, but it doesn't stop the transformation that we're going through at the moment and can't stop yeah. it. So, and, and, and I agree with you. I mean, you know, my, my, my kids' school are frequently saying to them, the only, the only failure is when you stop trying, and my God, they haven't stopped trying. It's very impressive. No, exactly. The, the tenacity exactly. is the other value I would point to. They just keep holding yes. on and finding a way. It's very impressive. Otherwise known as stubbornness. Stubbornness. Now, Chris, Christiana, you may or may not remember. Stubborn you once, optimism. You once gave a speech, which, which you said you wrote very quickly just beforehand in London, but I saw a room of about 1,000 people in the Guildhall in London actually electrified by what you said and you talked about the noise and the signal and, and the, the signal. noise exactly. and the signal yeah, yeah, yeah. and you drew their attention to the difference so thank yeah. you for doing that yeah. again yeah. yeah true true i do remember that well what a wonderful conversation and now we should turn our attention to, to uh, the, the the next the next layer down uh, the political which sphere is, right yeah the political sphere you know what 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 is going on politically how does this affect or not affect uh, the November elections. And above all, I would love to get John Podesta, who we'll talk to now, John Podesta's view on what's happening in the public airwaves, or airwaves because it does seem like uh, the Republicans have completely swamped the airwaves uh, in order to taint the public's opinion about this. So let's talk to John about the political implications of this. Great. Clay, can we give him a call? Yes, um, I got the line open. Okay. One second. Are you recording? Recording, yeah. Okay. Do you know? I what? like Paul's techno DJ look with one ear over and one ear out. Do you yeah. remember the line, Christiana? Are you recording? Yes, I'm recording in AirPods. Okay, thank you. Do you remember the? Hey, John. Hi. How are you? Well, we're good. We're good. John, thanks so much for taking our call on the spur of the moment. Really appreciate that. Um, so we are looking into this Supreme Court ruling against EPA's authority. Um, and we just spoke to Gina McCarthy, who gave us an excellent interpretation from a legal and from a policy perspective. So that was very helpful. We wanted to ask you, John, on the political side of this, especially how does this affect the prospects for November elections? Do you think Republicans are digging in? Are Democrats going to come out of the woodwork on this one as well as on Roe v. Wade? Uh, you know, is, is this going to actually wake up the sleeping Democrats? <laughs> Or not. Um, are we rolling? Yes. Yeah, yeah we're rolling. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, look, I think this triple whammy of the end of the Supreme Court term has certainly changed the dynamic going into the election. The reversal of Roe v. Wade, the decision that, this, for example, the state of New York can't regulate carrying a concealed weapon on the New York City right. subway – combined with this decision, which I think is part of the outrage part of your program, not the optimism part of your program. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, yes. We spent a lot that of time on that. Hobbles the, uh, that well, hobbles. Well, well, well identified, uh, John. That, you know, hobbles the administration's ability uh, to, uh, as the uh, Justice Kagan said in dissent, address the most pressing environmental challenge of our time. Uh, were uh, the combination of those, I think, has woken people up uh, to the fact that this is a court that's both out of control, careening to the right, and that this was the result of politics. Uh, yeah. This wasn't uh, 
uh, the, uh, you know, a, a sort of a curiosity of, uh, of unique views of these, of, of these justices. This is a court that was purposely stacked to create these outcomes. Um, by Trump. And- uh, by Trump and by uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader. Hmm. Uh, remember the uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch, who wrote a, a concurrence, which was even more radical than the than the opinion of the majority, uh, was put on the court because McConnell effectively uh, and, un- and in an unprecedented way blocked the appointment uh, that President Obama made of Merrick Garland. Then he forced through Trump's nominee, Amy Comey Barrett, uh, in the very last days uh, of uh, before the election of 2020, uh, when it was clear that the uh, that there was at least a likelihood that um, they would lose control of the of, of the White House. Also unprecedented to push a nomination through that late. So they created this super conservative majority on the court uh, with, you know, malice aforethought, as they say. And uh, and then this is what we got. This is the result yep. that we got. Uh, it's anti-majoritarian. I mean, these position these are opinions that two thirds of the American public disagree with. Um, and uh, it, it uh, creates a context in which the court is protecting polluters against future generations. And this case in particular um, doesn't end the ability of the EPA, as I'm sure uh, Gina McCarthy noted, uh, to be able to regulate uh, CO2 and greenhouse gases. Uh, But it certainly makes it more difficult, more costly uh, to uh, do what the country absolutely needs to do, which is to change its power system to clean energy. And impact of this uh, what when you look at your crystal ball and granted it is only july and a thousand things will happen from now until november but what what are you seeing in your crystal ball well i think in november i think the the again the the if you take these two opinion particularly the abortion opinion and this opinion together uh they will have a uh and we've seen that a little bit in the polling already have a tendency to mobilize uh, suburban women uh, in who are concerned about uh, abortion rights and uh, people across the country, really, who are concerned about abortion rights. Um, and young voters, I think, with respect to this decision, West Virginia versus EPA. Now, that still means a lot of work has to happen. And I think that we're, we're also in a context where the investments that the president has proposed are still uh, uh, haven't been pa- enacted in the Senate. And that's the result really of basically one or two senators, uh, particularly Joe Manchin, who has blocked forward progress on that. And so I think uh, young people were going into this election saying, you know, does it matter? Does politics matter? I, we went out and voted in 2020. Nothing kind of changed. Things are stalled. And uh, this is a proof point that Things do matter. Politics does matter. Politics does um, matter. Voting yeah. does matter. Voting absolutely does matter. But, you know, they'll also, I think, be influenced by whether in the end of the day, they could the the Congress is able to step up to the plate and do its job and enact these critical uh, climate investment uh, for in the power sector and transportation and buildings. Mm. John, this is, I mean, it's its so interesting that right now, you know, that the last month the conversation has been about abortion, guns and climate, right? And because that's what we've been talking about in the US, then actually you've seen some interesting swings that have suggested and, you know, people like Nick Cohen have suggested maybe the midterms won't be as bad as people think for the, for the Democrats. But November's a long time away and no doubt they will try and swing the topic back to immigration and crime and other things that are more favourable to them. What can be done between now and then to kind of keep the narrative and the conversation on these absolutely outrageous outcomes that have been driven by this corp supermajority and other different elements so that they do get punished at the polls in the way that right now it looked like they would do, but it might well not happen six months from now. 
Well, I think a couple of things. One is organize, organize, organize. <laughs> and there's plenty of, uh, uh, of interest and advocacy and passion that's, uh, you know, being generated uh, in reaction to these, these decisions. And there's uh, a few months left bef- before the election, but it means that people really need uh, at the grassroots level to organize for the, the critical races. Um, the other thing I think that uh, needs to happen, I think, is that the president needs to clearly articulate uh, what we've been talking about, that this was uh, a culmination of a system at the court that essentially rigged the results that were that we're seeing rolling back of individual rights strengthening of corporate power who funded all this yeah the coke network <laughs> you know the people yeah. who make a living off of polluting in america are the people who uh funded the infrastructure that built the support uh to uh focus on on the courts as their uh as a as a principal level lever of power uh, to thwart the will of the majority and support uh, the uh, interests of, of special interests in the case of fossil fuel uh, and the anti-abortion movement in uh, in the U.S. But there, there, if you look and 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 uh, at the act at the actors who have played a significant role um, in fight around the courts uh a lot of that money has come from fossil fuel interests yeah so, so john this is this is um it's kind of treason actually uh and i've read jane mayer's wonderful book dark money i mean wonderful terrible book um here's here's two questions really for you one is this is so serious uh in terms of national and global security will there not be consequences for the people who are identified as supporting this, you know, kind of radical uh, irresponsibility. My second question is about corporate power in the positive. We do have a global corporate movement, a global investment movement that's taking climate change extremely seriously. How can uh, those uh, better spirits of the global business system assert themselves to 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 oppose this this dangerous uh, activity? Uh- well, you know, I think to take the uh, second part first, I, I think it is really critical that that um, that business voices that understand where the future lies, understand that uh, their success is going to be built on, a, on 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 having a stable world, a stable economy, uh, both domestically and and globally. Uh, they need to speak up. Now, you notice uh, the right wing attacks on so-called woke capitalism. Uh, They know that if the business community does speak up, that their minority view, their uh, uh, the 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 view of the few as opposed to the many uh, will be uh, affected by that. And and so they have found a new, you know, and made up a new uh, villain in this saga. That's mm-hmm. why you see Ron DeSantis uh, taking so much pleasure in Florida of going ahead and attacking Disney uh, and, you know, others attacking corporations that kind of want to do the right thing and have, have stood up to it. But I think they also have to put their, in addition to what they're saying, I think they have to put their money where mm-hmm. their mouth is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they still, uh, a lot of their lobbying dollars still go to organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce yep. that are on the wrong side of these issues, yep. so they have to they have to have a reckoning with the fact that they're making serious commitments. I, I and I think they're trying uh, uh, in many cases to live up to those commitments, but they're still in the Washington context. They're still supplying and fueling uh, lobbying activities that are against the interests uh, of the public. Your question about whether people will be held to account maybe uh, takes me to the question of uh, what's going on 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 Capitol Hill right now in terms yeah. of the January sixth uh, committee hearings. You know that that's a that that is remains an open question whether um, we we see the the most radical fringe 
uh, being indicted, but what's going to happen to the people uh, who sat in the White House <laughs> and planned an insurrection? Uh, yeah. uh, whether the Justice Department has feels like it has enough evidence to, to take those people to court, I think they should um, uh, do. Uh, if 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 they believe they do, then they should proceed. Uh, there's they shouldn't try to discount for what the politics of that might look like. If people broke the law, they should be held to account, mm-hmm. including and up to the former president. You know, John, um, mm. the, the tone of, uh, of you, what you have just shared with us, um, is in striking contrast to the tone of Gina. Gina basically said to us, look, you know, yes, this is a ruling, but it's a narrow decision. It is not going to stop what the United States is doing on climate change because we have many other levers, let alone what the world is doing on climate change. Your tone, John, is one that actually, so that gave us some optimism. Your tone is one that gives us actually much more concern because you're here looking at it, not just from the climate perspective, but from the political perspective in the United States. And I dare say beyond the United States, this move to, you know, what we stupidly call the right uh, is one that we're seeing in many other countries uh, with huge ramifications. So I do, do I end a conversation here being more concerned than before I talk to you? Uh, probably, <laughs> because it's not just a move to the right. It's a move. Uh, it's an anti-democratic move. It's a move towards, anti-democratic. It's a it's yeah. a move uh, towards uh, using uh, authoritarianism and levels of po- levers of power to mm. uh, to entrench power uh, and um, and deny the will of the majority. Uh, and I think that is, in fact, happening not just in the United States. And uh, so I think our democratic crisis and our climate crisis today are really linked. Link- and mm. uh, and while I I uh, at one level agree with with Gina that there's still and and that the president has to do everything he can uh, to try to use the authority that uh, was. Uh, retained essentially by the court, they d- they didn't go so far as to say the EPA can't regulate uh, CO two. Right. They they largely uh, were arguing about uh, and making more difficult and more expensive the the uh, the prospect and the context of the way uh, CO two is regulated. Um, but uh, it's an indication that. Um, the forces that really want to maintain the status quo in the face of the absolute critical need to uh, change, reform, innovate, build out a new economy that's based on clean rather than dirty are alive well, and they're going to do everything they can to resist change. Mm-hmm. Uh, democratic force forces can still overcome that. But I think everybody should be concerned. Yeah. And yes. I think outraged, quite frankly. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Wow. Uh, well, thank you for that sobering, uh, sobering thought, um, John. Thanks very much. And, you know, we would love if you would allow us to have you back on as we get closer to the November elections. Uh, as we have said, many things can happen from now until then. But we're all uh, keeping a very watchful eye and would love to have your insight as we get, I would say, dangerously close to the <laughs> November election. <laughs> okay. Uh, love to do it. Thanks, Thanks very John. much, John. Thank you. Thank all. you. Bye. How great to talk to John Podesta. I mean, as last time, he just is such an insightful analyst on the existing situation of the politics and what a concerning conversation. Where are you both now? Well, um, very sobering, right? Uh, but I think also very realistic, yeah. very realistic to, uh, to see it that way. And, um, you know, just, just to underline it even further, as I was doing some reading, preparing for this conversation, I chanced upon a study of um, Facebook 
use between June 30 and July 5, the six days after the ruling. And very interesting. I mean, Facebook is not everything. Social media is not everything. But we do know that there is a very deliberate use of public airwaves. And fascinating to learn that the right-leaning pages produced almost 60% more posts about the case, and you can imagine how they interpreted it, not the way Gina interpreted it, um, but 60% more than the left-leaning pages. And those right-leaning posts received more than 70% more interactions in total. That's an interesting statistic, right? A, they, just to put it out, us and they here, which I uh, hesitate to do, but in this case, I think quite warranted, they are more eloquent and they are more interconnected with each other and supporting each other's voices than those on the left, than those, you know, who, who share uh, the political views on climate and other things that we share. And so, you know, to add to John's very sobering uh, thoughts there, we're up against a much better organized social impression or social manipulation, social um, thinking manipulation than we actually think there is. And I mean, on that exact point, um, there's an obvious reason for that. And that is, it's so much harder for them. They actually have to go against a global scientific consensus. They have to go against you know, millions of striking children. They have to go against the majority of the of the citizens of the world. So they they have to organize themselves ruthlessly using a lot of money, as John said, and and a kind of you know a, a set of military strategy. But I actually took some comfort from one of the more striking things John just said, which is the crisis of climate is also a crisis of democracy, mm. and I think that when you know, the citizens of the OECD, um, you know, the powerful economies. I mean, of course, the citizens of the world. I mean, you know, great countries like India and Brazil and, you know, these are marvelous democracies. But but when the when all the democratic nations of the world um, are united to protect their governing system, the separation of powers, the rule of law, the freedom of the press, um, that those critical bits of infrastructure um, are part of this struggle. And, you know, some of the, some of the autocratic states, you know, some in the Middle East where they don't have elections or, or Mr. Putin blowing up half of Europe with his artillery. This is, this is what the, f the fossil fuel producers look like. We have to combine a rigid defense both of our climate, but also of our principles, of our way of life, if I can use a time-honored phrase. So I think that that's something we can build around. So that I felt positive about that. Mm. Christiana, that's fascinating what you just came up with there about Facebook and the engagement after the ruling. It, it reminds me also a little bit, I've mentioned on this podcast before, when Putin invaded Ukraine, um, the US public was more or less evenly split between blaming Putin, the oil companies, and the president. X many millions spelt by the oil companies later, pretty much everyone blamed the president, you know, and they've then they've been very thoughtful yeah. about doing it. And and exactly. your your I like I like your analysis, Paul, but the other thing I would point out, having observed this happen over years, is that there is a much stronger instinct towards message discipline on that side of the ledger. There's much less, yeah. I want the future, but I want it in my particular way, and I'm gonna argue about exactly what form it comes in and what are the rules and is it ethical. It's much more, we're all going in this direction. And actually they You've got to admire it in some ways that you're right, Paul. They have a higher mountain to climb. They don't have truth on their side. Actually, there's a lot of money on our side of the debate now as well. But the instinct to message discipline They're and more consistency, it's amazing. And, and nobody's controlling that. That's just how they work. And so that is a difficult thing for us to kind of go up against and, and be successful, which is why we keep losing these narrative battles over and over again. And that's why, you know, what I was afraid of in the conversation with John is that there's been this outrageous stacking of the court. There's been this reduction of civil liberties in the US with Roe v. Wade. There's been the expansion of gun ownership all across the country. Gun ownership, when you look at what's happened in the last few years, and now there's been the removal of the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions 
And it's not clear they're going to pay a political price for that because we haven't successfully, consistently landed the message about what's really happened with enough people. And that's actually a wake-up call to all of us. That should be the easiest goal to land, to move forward, and it's not clear we're going to do it. And you heard that in John's voice. So we need to move through this and find a better way to advance. Anything else to add before we end the episode? This has been a thoughtful conversation, I think. Amazing to have both Gina and John on today. In, in these struggles in history, because of what you've just said, Tom, um, the kind of baddies do tend to do very well at the start. But over time, the more creative, looser federation of allies do tend to unite and win. So we have to I, remember I agree with that you. confidence drives us. The trouble is, the thing we don't have anymore is any time. It's time. That's the problem. Christiana swallowed an alarm clock. It's a concern. <laughs> Right. Time, time, time. What a privilege to have both these brilliant people on the podcast. And it's been a real roller coaster from the sort of the opportunities of regulation and innovation to the challenges of politics. Hope you have enjoyed this episode and come with us. We this was not outrage and optimism. This was out uh, optimism. optimism. No. <laughs> And outrage in that direction. It was, yeah. Uh, but we know they're always finely balanced, whichever order they come in. And um, I hope you've enjoyed these last two episodes. It's been an experiment for us to kind of run these long conversations and be on the phone and call friends. We'd love to know what you think. If you have enjoyed this new format, maybe we'll make a habit of it. Let us know. Clay will put links in terms of how to reach us in the show notes. Thanks as ever. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. So there you go. Another episode of Outrage and Optimism. This is Clay, producer of the show, and I am here with some very short credits this week and no music. So be sure to stay tuned for more music coming your way next week. Um, Thank you so much to Gina McCarthy and John Podesta for joining us on the show. And as Tom said, we would love to know what you think of this different format we're trying out. You know, a little bit longer conversation, calling up friends and colleagues as we move through a topic. Um, You can email us at contact at globaloptimism.com. We've done two episodes this week in this format. So if you haven't heard the first one we did, it came out on Tuesday. And it's, uh, it's just one episode back in our podcast feed. Thank you in advance for emailing us. Okay, before I go, I need to let you know, there's only two more weeks left of podcasts until we take our little summer break. And I don't want you to miss anything that we're planning for next season because we're already planning it. I I can't tell you everything that's going on, but there's some really exciting things coming up. Uh, If I keep talking, I'm gonna tell you, I gotta stop. The best way for you to hear what is coming up is to hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, uh, Stitcher, there's too many, there's anywhere. And then when we post episode one of season six, it'll be right there. You won't miss a thing. Okay, thanks for listening. Enjoy the weekend and we'll see you next week.